Okay, so Nick, you're recording. That's fine. Are you guys ready to start? It's okay. Let's just give uh, two minutes and then we can start at exactly 5 or 5. Okay, that's okay. okay. Okay, so it's already 5 or 5, um, so we can start. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. I hope you did not have any trouble joining in and I hope you enjoy what we have in store with, uh, for you. So my name is Pavanrat Singh Chana and I'm a final year medical student from Moi University, which is in Elrate, Kenya. I will be your moderator together with Faith Chapkari today. Um, and yeah, we just hope you enjoy. So as you all know, research is just proven to be integral in the field of practice uh, of medicine and all health uh, care disciplines, helping um, not only uh, help uh, us understand what we're doing wrong, but help us to realize that shift um, and change to what has been proven to be more effective. And then also uh, in the development of scientific uh, advancements. So with that, with that to say, we need basis, and this, and this basis starts from now and starts from today. So um, the Moi uh, Standing Committee uh, of Research Exchange, SCORI, um, uh, Medical Students Association, Kenya Msake, Repub team, and uh, Federation, uh, Afri the Federation of African Medical Students, FOMSA, uh, Standing Committee of Medical Research and Exchange, that's uh, FOMSA, SCOMA is, has collaboratively brought this session um, to address um, various research components in the subsequent weeks. So for today, we have uh, the agenda of basic research skills, proposal writing and introduction to a more university research club that we'll tell you about. And we have two speakers as, you, as you've seen from the posters and that's our very own um, Dr. Joyce Palidawa, JB and Dana Buri. So um, Dr. Balidawa will go first and then we'll have Dr. Uh, Dan Aburi after, uh, after her. So we will also have a question and answer session in the end. So please feel free to write down any of your questions in the Q&A section. We have a few housekeeping rules. That's just please switch off your mics unless directed to speak and please keep the chat box 
respectable with due modesty observed. That's about it. So um, I'll just talk briefly about the, the organizations I've mentioned, and then I will introduce Dr. Balidao. So SCORI, as I mentioned, is under Msake and uh, IFMSA, that's the International Federation of Medical Students um, Association. And it's a group to help students with research opportunities and exchange electives, not only in Kenya, but all over the world. So through such, um, we aim to develop culturally sensitive students and skill researchers to help shape the world of science. So I am part of that as research coordinator together with Faith, who's uh, the research, uh, the local officer at Moi University. And there's also Repub, which is a collaborative project with Msake and Daktari Online. It's a platform for students to actually publish their work as students at absolutely no cost. So we have uh, Sharon Muturi, um, within our team. She's a local officer at Moi University and she will address these components in the end. And then finally, we have Farms of SCOMA, uh, which is also a non-governmental institution recognized by WHO and the African Union. It's a network for medical students uh, championing global health development and, uh, of medical profession and response to any issues that trouble it. So we have Joyce, which is, uh, who's also in our school, which is part of that. So they will tell you more about this. Yeah, so with no further ado, um, allow me to present our first speaker, Dr. Balidao. Dr. Balidao completed her PhD in medical education at our university more than 10 years ago. She was the first lady and is now colloquially referred to as the first lady. Uh, she's a senior lecturer, uh, senior staff at the College of Health Science, and she's been the COPS committee um, chair um, for a long time and has been part of this team ever since she joined uh, Moi University. She has supervised PhD um, students, master and undergraduate students with their research projects and she's proposing to set up a research directorate at, uh, at CHS. So she loves research and you, as, you've, as, as I mentioned that she's been really experienced with uh, and handled many um, projects. And she's very passionate about also medical education. She wants her projects to be the best of the best. So Dr. Balidawa, you're welcome. Okay, um, good evening. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, as you've heard, my name is Dr. Balidawa and I'm currently the COPS chair. And I think I'll um, be able to um, share a lot of issues relating to research before we actually go into the basics of um, the skills we're supposed to be talking about in research. Maybe you could just start screening. So basically that's the first slide and basically it's just telling us about what it's all about, the score research exchange program and I'm the presenter. Next one. Next slide, please. Chana. <laughs> Okay, so um, I just want to tell you a bit about the presentation format, because basically we're talking about two things here. You need to know about what COBS is and what's its role in basic research skills development, and also how we're likely to fit into what um, Chana has told us about the students' uh, exchange program and how we would all fit in. So where you see where they connect is what we are actually sitting here today to do and to address. Next slide. Next. It's come on my end. <laughs> Next slide. Has it reflected? No. No. Let me just manually peruse. So, Is it okay um, now? So I just wanted you to know what COPS is all about. COPS in full is community-based education and services. And we're trying to see how we can work with the International Federation of Medical Students Association. And the standing committee, which is holding this uh, session today is the standing committee on research exchange. Next. So that is what we mean that COPS community-based education and service. Next slide, please. 
So basically, when we get to such a forum, we ask ourselves basic skills in research. Why do we have to do research anyway as students? What is research? Who does research? How are the researchers trained? Where, do res where is research done? What is done in research? Who should do research in health? How is research done? And um, who, for whom is research done? I think before we can even talk about basic skills, we have to answer those questions. And I think um, the next slide should be able to help us understand and answer those questions. So the skills for the 21st century healthcare professional are as listed. There are not many, they're just five. They must be critical thinkers, they must be analytical, they must be evidence-based practitioners, and they must be proactive and of course, agents of change. Listening to all that, it's reflected. And I believe that by the time we're finishing, we should be able to see how these skills will actually be engendered in our products. And through, um, by the end of it all, we'll be able to share and actually understand how we actually make our, uh, our researchers critical thinkers, analytical, evidence-based practitioners, proactive, and of course, agents of change. Next. So and in addition to that, there are additional skills which are needed by all healthcare professionals. I don't just talk about the doctors. I train eight cadres at the College of Health Sciences. And these students must have the following additional skills. They must be information seekers and knowledge management people. They must, be, they must be able to critically review information sought and its application. And they must also actually be skilled in information collection, utilization, application through use of technology and focusing on telemedicine and telehealth. Now that COVID is here, it's giving us a challenge for what we have been doing previously. And of course, they must also be well grounded in informatics, in health related issues. And of course, use standard operating procedures when doing whatever they do, the way they do it. The other additional skills we feel that these researchers must have, good communicators with appropriate communication skills, should be patient-centered healthcare providers with a human heart. What are, these, what are these qualities? Must be empathetic, must be flexible, must be articulate, must be team players, must be IT compliant. Now, how do we get all those skills? How should we get all those skills? And last but not least, overall, must be an all-round when undertaking research. What does it entail to be an all-round when undertaking research? Next. So we, is, you know, required training to become a healthcare professional for the 21st century is undertaken by our, our COPS program at the College of Health Sciences. And here we believe that, as I have said, community-based education and services, that's what COPS is. It's in the College of Health Sciences. More university, for those who don't know, is the second university in Kenya. It was set up for purposes of being community-oriented, research-oriented, and it actually is the flagship of the university. Flagship in the sense that it trains, it undertakes research, and at the same time engages in outreach activities. So the uniqueness of our COPS program basically is to try and bring out these skills we have listed. So emphasizing community oriented, making it unique. No university in Kenya has that kind of program. And as far as we're concerned, the community, when people talk about the community, they think the rural settings. No, for us, we deal with community, which is urban, peri-urban and the rural setting. So the concept of community is very general and we believe to take it you know, in that perspective. And of course, with a research look focus, which is evidence-based, we cannot churn out healthcare professionals who are not evidence-based and they must be trained properly and adequately. So the production of a holistic healthcare professional is our ultimate goal in our COPS program. And it's good for, to acknowledge our predecessors in the COPS program. We cannot say that we are a flagship because we are the ones who have done all this. So that is the list of our former deans and also the chairperson people who have actually made COPS to be what it is. 
we actually feel very proud of their contributions. Uh, we cannot, but we have to always be mentioning their names. You will have Professor Mengech, who is now at JQuat, Professor Otsula, Professor Samai, who is in um, Alupe right now, Professor Ayo, Professor Alukoye, who is now the vice, uh, sorry, the dean for the Medical School of East Africa. And of course, Professor Kwena, and the current one of the dean is Julia Songok. With the chairpersons, you can see Swaswa Odero, who is in Maseno, Dr. Menya School of Public Health, Professor Tiang, uh, sorry, that should now be Professor, then Professor Kenya Nairobi, Professor Esamai, who is the principal at Lupe, and Professor Nangami, who is at, so you can actually see the array, they are all professors. And of course, retired Mr. Benson Mangera, who was the outgoing web and I took over. So community-based education in a nutshell, let us just run through quickly. What is it? Why do we do COBS? Who does COBS? How is COBS done? Where does COBS and where is COBS done? What are the achievements of COBS and what are the challenges in COBS? And of course, what are these areas of collaboration? I started off with those two circles, each independent in its uniqueness. We have the SCOPE program. We also have the COBS program, but now they must come together to make sure that we are understanding why we are here. So in a nutshell, again, it's a training health, it's a training program for our healthcare professionals at Moore University. It's a college-wide activity, constitutes 27% of any academic year. All years, all students must do COBS. All members of staff are involved in COBS. What do we do in COBS? We impart theory. We make sure that we're also engaging in clinical activities at the same time, um, field activities, emphasizing theory, research and outreach activities. And what are the foundations? As far as we're concerned, everybody and everybody, all eight programs, interdisciplinary, meaning all disciplines are involved. Interprofessional education, meaning we, as far as we are concerned, no profession is superior to other when it comes to research. It's integrated. Nobody, everybody has something to add to the research agenda. All the various sectors that are involved must actually undertake research. And it's collaborative. Collaborative in the sense that we try to put together research teams which enable the collaborative research arena to actually be carried out. And of course, multidisciplinary. We have eight programs, which we will see much later, how they actually come together to actually conduct research. Next. So why we do COPS, we want to make sure that our students have the various skills that they need to do research. And here it's participatory research, community participation, community directed initiatives and so on. And of course, we have to make sure that they use technology to be able to do research. So for purposes of health promotion, disease prevention, curative, rehabilitation, and intervention. And therefore, health education is the core of what we do. Health services management, and of course, we have to address also the health economic issues. <clears throat> so who does COBS? You can see on your left-hand side, School of Medicine, School of Nursing, School of Dentistry, and School of Public Health. All these guys must be trained in research. All the years from year one up to year five, it's a five-year program. Meaning when I put where it's a yes, 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 they have to do it. And where it's a double yes in year four, it means that these programs are four-year programs and they must actually do the COPS five in their fourth year of study. So that simply explains the whys and how some have doubled and others are just single wise. So medicine takes five years, it does it quite comfortably, but the four year programs have the four, the two double wise in the year four and school of dentistry also is a five year program, therefore they're quite comfortable. What is done in COPS? I've just put everything in a nutshell. We have to make sure that we are addressing the primary healthcare concepts. And here they must acquire the research skills for prevention, for promotion, for curative, for rehabilitation and intervention. But I like to add that the intervention arm, we will add three I's, intervention, investigation and innovation. 
In other words, our healthcare professionals must actually be able to do all those five. If you just focus on one, curative, what percentage is that? 20%. If you just focus on promotion, that's only 20%. So for my holistic healthcare professional at CHS, they must prevent, they must promote, they must cure, they must rehabilitate, and they must do the three I's. Inter interventions, investigations, and innovation. Next. And so that is the scope. Um, if you just go back the first. So the, the first, these are the first eight elements of PHC as dictated to us by WHO. And we are saying to be a researcher, you must know, first of all, education. The, the, if you take the first letter of all those ones, you'll find that it's actually elements. The PHC elements are taken care of. What should we be doing? Prevent, promote, cure, rehabilitate, and intervene. So it's a, we've added to the eight. Next slide, please. We have to also address HIV and AIDS. We have to address malaria. We have to address dental health. We have to address mental health. We have to address TB, uh, health management information systems. We have to also address the CDs. Now CDs have two arms, chronic and communicable diseases. Our healthcare professionals, regardless of program, must do all that research-wise. And of course, we have to add non-communicable diseases, neglected tropical diseases, health management and health economics, health management information systems, followed, next slide. And of course, we have our emerging diseases, which are now giving us a run for our money. COVID-19, Ebola, Leishmaniasis, and Onchocerciasis. That is, in a nutshell, the scope. So who does COBS? What, uh, how is COBS done? We have to teach skills, introduction to the community, skills for community diagnosis, skills for development of research proposals, skills of working with the counties and so on. And of course, skills on implementation of interventions in communities. And of course you see that is done in year, from year two to five, but otherwise each year has its own distinct area where it requires to get particular skills needed to be researchers. Next. So where do, where do we take our students to do their research? Um, we have student numbers and we have COBS 2 and COBS 5 mainly. Um, COBS, one, COBS 1 is uh, theory, COBS 2 is field, COBS 3 and 4 is proposal development, COBS 5 is in the counties. And of course you find that we have a number of stations. We have 20 for COBS 2 and 22 for COBS 5. All in the name of trying to get the skills that are required to do research. Next slide, please. So these are, the, these are the field stations. I hope Chana will be able to share with you with the slides. You have an idea that we cover Western and Rift Valley and Nyanza areas. You can actually see we cover Western Kenya. And of course, you can see all the various counties where we go, a total of about 22. We've used 22 stations for COPS 2 and equally number for COPS 5. What are the achievements? I think we've achieved a lot when it comes to training researchers. We now have eight, um, we have eight programs. We also have, um, we have done a number of um, mentoring to other institutions in the region. We have attended a number of international conferences, all as a way of exhibiting those research skills, which we have mentioned are necessary. And of course, I'm proud to say that our products are sought after, especially in the research areas and administrative positions. Next. So if FAMSA COPS collaboration, we believe that coming together, we're going to actually bring together a circle of partners, diverse ecosystem enabling innovative research. We're going to talk about, we're going to actually get together collectively to create a healthier future when it comes to research. And of course, we'll be dealing with the key stakeholders in research, pronounced uh, prominent researchers. We will have an opportunity to meet them as and when we can in contact with them. 
We're going to be dealing with policymakers and of course government agencies and academic health centers, international organizations, as well as community organizations. So that just gives you an idea as a FAMSA where COPS can come in, where COPS will come in and where COPS can be of assistance. So the wider circle, we're going to be dealing with the primary care issues. We also have to see how best we work with the private sector and industry, uh, also the professional societies and the, and the various foundations. And of course, we don't leave out the crucial people who make us to be who we are. These are the patients, the citizens, as well as the scientists. And so what is the advantages of this collaboration? From our perspective as COPS committee, this forum provides an opportunity for proactively raising awareness and information on the health issues which, has, which we have listed in the scope of work in the respective settings. Regardless of where you guys come from, as far as we are concerned, we're going to work together collaboratively as a united team when it comes to research. So what is our research agenda? I think I felt there's a need for us to outline it clearly. So how best we, um, the leadership of IFAMSA, we think we need to review and evaluate the evidence behind the practice. And what is the, that evidence behind the practice? I have outlined the scope of work. Then the capabilities to understand the benefits and harms associated with the practices. Each of those scope of areas we have dealt with have their benefits and harmful practices which we have been uh, you know, engaging in. Review methodology. As we acquire these research skills, we have to review our methodologies. How have we been doing things? How should we be doing things? How must we now do things? COVID has actually challenged us. Face-to-face -face is now challenged. How should we now continue? In fact, right now, as I speak, I'm busy, we're busy working out with the committee. How best to now transfer a community-based program like COBS and use technology and even digitalize it and move on to the e-learning platforms, which we are being told we must now use without hesitation. We must engage and train community-based partners to improve the outcomes of risk groups. Right now, the national policy is talking about home-based care. I don't have to now blow the trumpet for COBS. Basically, COVID has brought on why COBS must be emphasized and why it must be given the status it is befitting to it. We think of communicating effectively about public alerts on health issues. Are we doing that correctly? How should we do that correctly? How should we guide what is being done? This is the International Federation of Medical Students. And as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to add the dimension that International Federation for Healthcare Professionals. Then we think of the guidance with technology and technological audience. We're not going to escape this one. We definitely have to go that direction. And these are some of the things now, as we think as researchers and the skills that we need to do, we have to make our, we have to cast our net wide. Composition of the healthcare teams. For the first time, we hear mention of all the eight cadres that we train at the College of Health Sciences managing COVID-19 patients. It just goes to show that we have to even re-strategize what our research skills should be and what they should actually, what we should actually be promoting. Last but not least, implementation practices to improve the general health status of our communities. Where are our communities? We've already said they are anywhere, everywhere. And therefore we have to be dealing with anyone, anywhere, everyone, and all those cadres. That is our research agenda, which I'm now putting out to FAMSA to think about and to score, to think seriously about. Next. So what will we be doing? As far as I'm concerned, we will launch targeted specific health messages aimed at preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, and investigative actions. We will be able to engage in healthcare, we'll engage healthcare providers of the various institutions involved. Chana, you did not make um, a summary of who is around, but I believe this information is of relevance to anyone
who is a healthcare professional and is interested in engaging in research. And then of course, we're going to rapidly advance health in the respective communities. And of course, last but not least, mobilize community partners, but we cannot do that unless we get the particular research skills, which we require for the 21st century. So implementation strategy, I think we're going to just be sharing information. We're going to uh, develop evidence-based approaches to healthcare. We're going to make sure there's engagement with key stakeholders. We're going to design and conduct workshops. We're going to write papers, publications. We're going to, and all this again, needed to be put into perspective before we start talking about the various research skills. And therefore we need to create working groups to take action and promote public advocacy for health issues from a student's perspective. It has always been the top down. It's about time students tell us what, whether we're doing what we're doing, even the research skills we are teaching them, are they the appropriate ones? These days it's the young blood that dictates. We're right now being told we're too old, we have to be retiring. So students, I'm calling upon you to guide us on what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. Next. So what are the challenges? I think that one is standard. You will be able to financial technological advancement if we're going to do what we're supposed to do, visibility of our programs, follow up on intervention projects, feedback to stakeholders, technological advancement, uh, the COBS portal link and things, collaboration, research implementation, and how to undertake responsible research initiatives. Responsible research initiatives, that is now what is going to dictate the skills that we require. Next. So the way forward, as I started, I will end by saying that we have to be, interprofessional approaches must be adopted. We have to be multidisciplinary. We must be interdisciplinary. We must be intersectoral, we must be multisectoral, we must be in integrated, and we must be collaborative. Next. Finish? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Palidawa, for that very, um, in-depth uh, um, appreciation of our COPS uh, program and also the perspective um, shift that even I have appreciated. Uh, and, and, and thank you for solidifying the reasons why we have the program and why we do uh, and why we follow such steps um, and, and, and the reason behind it. So thank you so much for that. I will now hand over to Faith to, um, I think she wants to conduct a small icebreaker and then we can um, go to Dana Buri who can take us through um, uh, research proposal writing skills. So Faith. Hello, Faith. Hmm. I think Faith has disappeared somehow. Oh, Faith is back. Hello, Faith, can you hear me? Yeah, hello, guys. I'm so sorry, I got disconnected for a while. You can hear me? Okay, so um, uh, before we go on to the next session, oh, my, my name is Faith, a medical psychology student here at 3 at Moi. And um, before we move on to our, our awesome next uh, presenter, facilitator, who is Dan Aburi, uh, I'd like us to do um, an interactive session for a while and then we can move on. So uh, for this one, I'd like you guys to, if you could please, uh, uh, like uh, type, go to Chrome or Google or uh, go to Safari, Chrome or Google and type uh, slide, uh, slider.com, sorry. Just go to your browser 
and Google that. Let me share my screen so that you can see what I'm saying. Um, so, it's just a, uh, sorry, a short session. And um, so, are you guys there? Uh, at slider.com so um you'll be asked for a code and the code is 10 uh, Yeah. Oh, guys, are you there? Sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, so it's just like a short session. And the first question is, um, do you think uh, institutions should be open? Um, yeah. With this COVID situation, do you think the learning institution should be reopened? And I'm seeing a number of guys have voted. And yeah, 15 votes so far. And yes, 56%, no, 44%. Oh, interesting. Okay, so let me give um, one more minute and then we can move on to the next one or 30 more seconds. Uh, 19 votes so far. Okay, let's move on to the second one. Um, the second one is on a scale of one to seven, how are you feeling today? How, how is COVID taking you, quarantine and all? How just are you on a scale of one to seven? Interesting. So uh, most people are between four and five. So like on a normal scale, okay. So so we are back to nineteen. So no, uh, people are just between four and five. I think you're just there. And then some are a bit harder, at five percent. Two at five percent. Okay, interesting. Yeah, with all this COVID, just uh, try to find something you like and all. And to the happy ones on six and seven, it's good. To keep being happy and keep doing what you do. And then we go to the third one. Um, and the last one, what's the first thing that you will do once quarantine is over? Just type one word. What's the first thing you will do once quarantine is over? Mm, party, swimming, interesting. A vacation. Wow, visit Mexico. This is interesting. Find my girlfriend. Thank God. I love this. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Leave. Uh huh. I think you're 13. I think 30 more seconds, then we can move on. I travel home. Visit my colleagues. Interesting. Catch up with people. Go to school and look for a job. Nice. So I can see you guys have plans after quarantine. Hopefully, all this will be over and done with as soon as possible. And yeah. 
So thank you for that uh, short session. I hope your mind was a bit relieved from the first session. It was really nice and insightful. Thanks to Dr. Balidawa. And now we can move on to um, Chana, who, can, who will introduce our next facility now. Over to you, Chana. Thank you for that, Faith, uh, for that interesting break. So I would just like to jump in directly and introduce Dan Aburi. I've known Dan ever since I joined uh, medical school from my very first day. And I'm so honored to actually uh, share this platform and introduce him. So Dan will tell us about uh, writing a research proposal and his research experiences. Dan Aburi is actually a postgraduate student now undertake, undertaking clinical psychology in Moi University. He completed medical psychology about three years ago and left me behind. <laughs> He's currently working at AMPATH, and AMPATH is uh, an abbreviation for the academic model providing access to healthcare. It's, uh, it's part of our hospital, uh, Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital, and it's a collaboration between uh, Moi University and uh, American institutions, including Indiana, uh, Duke and the likes. So he's currently the research, he's one of the research assistants there, and he's actually the field coordinator for Transvaya County. He's involved in active research geared towards improving HIV care, which Ampat is really um, enthusiastic about, and he's working together with uh, various um, various disciplines and various students and, and, and healthcare, pro uh, healthcare providers to to to, to sort of holistically help with this. So without further ado, Dan, um, you're welcome. And yeah, thank you. you can continue. Thank you, Chanas, uh, so much for that presentation. And also, thank you, Faith, for that uh, exercise. It was an interesting one to know that one of us is really eager to go and meet a girlfriend after this quarantine. Anyway, without uh, wasting much time, I think I'll just jump into proposal writing, which is a, a topic that most students usually struggle with. So in COBS 2, which you are doing it as a team, COBS 3, you have to do you know, the proposal on your own. Then uh, uh, when you get to the fourth year, you have to actually do it completely again on your own. Now you are study all the way to the end. So proposal writing can be, a inch, can be a hectic exercise, but also can also be quite enjoyable when you just get to master a few techniques and a few tips around it. And uh, one of the first things that I think about proposal writing is first you have to get to know what topic you are interested in. What is the discipline that you like to explore? What is it that you see in the community that you're passionate about or you're curious, you like to know, or you want to change the way the things are operating within that uh, discipline. So once you have identified the need or you have identified the thing that you like to focus in, then it's paramount that you do something which I know most students don't like, but something called literature review. Uh, I think when I, when I look back to my years when I was a student and I'm presented with the aspect of I need to do a proposal, I need to write a proposal, the first thing is to run to, run to and start asking yourself is which method am I going, am I going to use? Am I going to be a quality study or a quantity study? Uh, what's going to be my sample size? Uh, how will the questionnaire look like? And we get so much stuck on the whole aspect of methodology and we even fail to enjoy the whole aspect of uh, proposal writing. So over the years and over the proposal I've also written uh, for my postgraduate, the first step I, which I realized was very critical is literature review. And uh, literature review is basically going to the internet or going to the databases that are already existing or going to the library and searching the topic of interest that you have uh, chosen to, to study, searching on it and finding who has done it globally, who has done it uh, within the African setup and who has done it within the Kenyan setup. For instance, the study I'm currently would like to work on is on the issue of burnout, also among the medical practitioners. And this time I focused mainly on the nurses so the first thing I did was to try and go to Google Scholar, is the one which usually has uh, uh, quite relevant research materials, and just searched uh, for all studies that have been done regarding burnout in nurses. So once you click the search button, sorry, I didn't, I was not able to share that, but I think once after this, you can try and just go and try it, whichever topic you're interested in. 
once you hit the search button on Google Scholar, then all the studies that have been done uh, regarding burnout in nurses are able to come up. Then it's also important to sieve uh, the, the, the results that you're getting so that you are, the, the people you quote at least have done those studies within a, a period of around 10 to 15 years. So there's a limit, there's a limit that you can be able to search on Google Scholar and say, I want to limit the number of years up to maybe up to around 10 years back, the research that have been done from there. So once you get these articles or these uh, abstracts from uh, these sites, then it's time now where this, the work begins, whereby I find it actually interesting when you start reading what people have done regarding that particular topic. So you're able to see like in burnout or what did they find out? Is burnout understood? Uh, is it actually a medical phenomenon that is still existing? And what are the gaps that these people are experiencing? So when you're doing a literature review, it's important to have something called a matrix. A matrix basically is just having a table in a word format, you can open it in word, which uh, you're able to summarize each article that you're reading. And your table can just have columns like a column having the title of that uh, proposal that you're reading or the article you're reading, the methodology they used, was it a qualitative study? Was it a cross-sectional study? Was it a, a prospective study? Was it a case retrospective study? They will, be able, they will be able to indicate based on uh, the, the article you're reading. What was the sample size? And uh, how did, what did they use? Which methodology they used to collect their data? So such factors are covered under the methodology component. You look at what were their, some of their objectives? What were their findings? And what are the gaps or limitations that they indicated that they did not cover in fully? So once you're able to do that for all the articles, Maybe, you, maybe let's say you found like 10 articles, then you're able to have a clear view of the area that you want to venture into. You have got enough background information. You understand the problem in a bit uh, depth way. Uh, you're able to see the area which you like to focus in. Maybe there's a particular area you feel like they need to add more information on, or more research is needed in a particular area based on what the other uh, researchers have gone ahead and done uh, before, before you. So once you've done that, then now it becomes a little bit easier to start now writing your proposal because once you have all this knowledge, then you can start. I think for me, I found it easier to start writing the literature review first, which is normally chapter two of the proposal. Maybe let me take us through this main key factors or features of uh, your proposal. Then I'll come to the way in which you can be able to write it. So basically, now when doing, for instance, a, a COBS, uh, proposal, we shall start with the introduction. The introduction really covers the phenomenon that you're going to study or you're interested in. For instance, in my case, I was saying it's burnout among the uh, health workers. So I will try and explain what is burnout and what, uh, how do, uh, maybe how can you uh, illustrate what burnout is and symptoms which people experience during burnout, just providing an overview of what uh, you're going to study. Then what follows after that is something called the problem statement. This is basically trying now to, you're trying to bring your readers into understanding the need as to why you have to want to focus on studying burnout. So you tell them, for instance, uh, there, there's a, there are high cases being experienced of burnout among the healthcare workers, but so little is being done in addressing it. And so that becomes like a problem statement. You're just trying to analyze what is it that you want to study about. And so that's why I want to go in the, into the field and find out, okay, what is the understanding of burnout and money and nurses and how are they managing it? How best can we be able to manage it so that we can be able to find uh, a standard of care for managing cases of burnout? From there, you look at the significance of the study. You just write a small close on why you want to do that study. What importance will it add? Of course, one of the main reasons is it adds the body of knowledge of research, but among other reasons, like for instance, it will inform policy and change the way things are done. And then this aspect of the research question. The research question is normally basically in line with your topic. So there's not much differences there. Just taking a topic and changing it into a question. Then from there, you've got the aspect of writing your objectives. We shall have one broad objective. Again, it is similar to your research question, similar to your topic. And under the uh, the main objective or the broad objective, then you have now 
the specific objective. I think it's really safer or wiser to stick with around uh, uh, three to four objectives so they can be able to be feasible for you to manage them. Because as you're writing each objective, you're going to have a way of, uh, how do I put it? How to collect information for that particular objective and you're going to discuss it when you come in, after you've collected your data and you want to analyze it. You should analyze each objective separately. So when you're writing your objective, try and look at them as different components, a whole by themselves. Like each objective can stand on its own and they don't overlap. And of course, when writing objective, we use what we've learned, I think from way when in high school, it has to be a smart objective using the, uh, the component of smart. It's specific, measurable, attainable, time bound. So that when we start to do it, it's something you can actually be able to measure. It's not ambiguous or uh, not clear. It has to be very clear straight to the point and you have to find a way of how you'll be able to measure it. So there, once you're able to have done your literature review, it will even be easier to formulate your objectives because at least you have an idea of how even the other researchers are able to frame their own objectives. Then from there, of course, you got the chapter three, which focuses on methodology. And the methodology, we talk about a number of things like what is your study site, uh, your study population or your target population, uh, your sample size. I, sample size is actually also a place whereby students struggle with, but I think it should not be a place, something to struggle with. Because once you have written the other parts, then it will be easier to calculate your samples. I think there are formulas which are given based on the study you're doing. If you're going quality or quantity, there are formulas which can help us be able to identify the sample size. So I think it shouldn't be able to give us a lot of headache. You can also consult with someone uh, who has done biostatistics or even with the lecturers. They can help when helping you identify your sample size. Uh, the type of study you're doing, uh, how you're going to collect your data, are you going to use a questionnaire, are you going to use photographs, are you going to record, you're going, you're going, how you're going to analyze your data, data storage, ethical considerations, inclusion and exclusion criteria. I think these are some of the aspects which we're going to, going to learn in class, which once you start your proposal, they both will be, make more sense once you start interacting with them. And then after that, after methodology, then of course, we have the aspect of the, what are the expected outcomes of your pro, of the study you intend to do. And then finally, what are some of the limitations you think you'll encounter when doing your proposal? So basically that forms like the, the body of, right, of our proposal before you present it for, to IREC for approval. So those are some of the main components. There are some which I've left out because I think at the undergraduate level, uh, they may not be such uh, crucial for you to use. So then now, once you have uh, this understanding in your mind, where do you start writing your proposal? As I said earlier, it's I find it easier and advisable for us to, for a student to start writing the literature review because this way you're able to internalize all the data and the information that you've gathered and put your mind together and write a flowing document globally in the African setup and the Kenyan setup. What has been done concerning this? phenomenon you're studying or this topic you're studying. You're breaking it down and saying, so and so did this and they found out this, so and so did this, they found out this, these are the gaps that uh, we found. And uh, so it makes more sense to give you a perspective and direction in which you're able to, to, to proceed from there. Then after you've done your literature review, then now you can come to the introduction because you're already coming from a place whereby you have full of knowledge and understanding of your topic in depth. So the introduction, again, as I said earlier, just explain uh, how, how, what is that phenomenon and how it makes sense. And also based on, uh, based again on, on what you found in your literature review, you can go to now look at what is the problem. You'll be able to pinpoint at it in a clear way. You're able to write your, your the significance and you're also able to formulate your objectives in an easy way. Methodology is a topic, is, a, is one of the segments also which can be quite, uh, let me say, daunting because of the crit its critical nature. And once you've done, you've seen what other people have been able to do in that field, then now you, you are able to compare with them because if you realize maybe in this study, people, have, there's no much which has been done in it. Maybe it would not be wise for you to start doing a, a quantitative study to just quantify because there's limited information on maybe the topic you want to, to, to do in. 
And when we say there's limited information or limited data, it's really safer to start doing a qualitative study. And yeah. I'm trying to use the word quantity and quality so that we can try and see uh, get the difference, a qualitative study and a quantitative study. When something is still new and has not been well understood, it's really safer to go with a qualitative study. But it's also okay, you can do a mixed method whereby you use both, uh, quality and quantity. So based on what the other researchers have done in the field, it will be able to inform you on which uh, study design you'll be able to, to choose. Although they also say, based on one personality, it can influence the kind of study design you'll choose. There are people who just love numbers. And so they will find themselves inclined to doing a quantitative study. And there are some people who just do not like dealing with the numbers. It's, they find it frustrating. And then such a person will incline themselves to use to doing a qualitative study and just deal with text and audio so that you can transcribe it and then analyze the themes from what uh, your presenters were able to say. So in a nutshell then, methodology, it, uh, you be, it will be better informed from based on what has been done before. And then now the, the final factors can come in as you try and uh, see what works best for you. And also the region or the area that you like to do your study. The other critical thing that normally is a challenge for students is uh, doing references. And uh, referencing can be quite a, a daunting task also, if you don't know how to do it. But one of the tools which you use to do it, I think maybe you can organize uh, and just do a, a, a learn on the soft. He's using an, an, a tool you call Mendly. I think uh, you've heard of that word, Mendly. With Mendly, you're able to have all these, the abstracts that you want to analyze. You're able to have them, put them there, load them there. So with Mendly, it's able to help you when you're typing and doing a literature review or you're writing any segment of your proposal. You're able to easily cite the, the researcher who did the article that you want to, to use in a particular reference. Or maybe you've quoted so and so, and then uh, maybe you put a Chinua Achebe. And then with the Mendeley, it's so much easier. And it's also very professional when you're using it. It's able to quote it easily for you because references are also very important. Once you do insight citations within the literature review, the ones at the end of the document, you're able to generate all of them. That's also something maybe students can also start uh, practicing on because you continue to build up on it as we continue, which is also very crucial. When your proposal is well uh, cited and the citations are very clear, it becomes even much appealing to the, to the lecturers or to your supervisor when they're going through it and even to the IRA committee. Um, and then of course, when you're doing proposal writing, it's also important to consider the timelines in which you want to, to do your, your, your research. So you, you have to picture the entire thing in your mind. When do you, for how long do you think you're going to do your proposal? Give yourself timelines. Maybe for by this time I want to be done with doing uh, my proposal writing, by this time hand it to my supervisor, get the corrections, hand it to IREC, and then be able to go to the field. So it's important you keep in mind all these uh, aspects. Yeah, so I think uh, I've been able to uh, just outline the key factors that are important when you're doing your proposal writing. It doesn't have to be a daunting task, but as you start exercising, exercising and practicing on them, it becomes much easier, even as we, as you continue. Chan, I think uh, I would like to pause there and maybe address questions if there is any. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Dan, for that um, wonderful um, discussion on research proposal writing. Um, I've gone through the experience and I can tell you it's hard at first, but it gets it get it gets better the more frequently you do you do it. So I'd just like to add on to what Dan has said. Um, Dan has a very interesting approach of writing a research proposal on looking at literature. And why this is important is because with literature reviews, you get to understand uh, what gaps uh, of knowledge are missing, especially in your context. Um, you can also relate, uh, you can also see other studies which have done in, in other countries and you want to try to adapt the same for your own setup because as you as you come to realize medicine is not fixed and it has to be very uh, individualized and uh, targeted to a specific population because um, that's how um, 
there are a lot of attributes that um, are behind that and uh, have underlying um, impacts on how you approach it. So you need to keep doing frequent research, especially for your context. So literature reviews give you an idea on what has been done elsewhere, but you, it might, you might get a different picture in your setup. So you get that idea. Uh, apart from that, you also, um, you can also, when looking at literature review, uh, come up with objectives, what you want to achieve in your, with your research. So this really helps because um, one, um, if you have like at least three objectives, like what you want to do, you can arrange your literature review in that order. So if you're looking at like us guys, we did a study on injury related mortality in MTRH and we wanted to find out the burden. That was our first objective. So we looked at statistics around the world and then in Africa and then in Kenya. Then we wanted to know the epidemiological features. So that was our second object. So we looked at literature saying, uh, looking at different features, whether it was males, females, ages, races, cultures, and the like, even social statuses. And then you look at things like uh, trends and, and the like. So you try to look at such literature on which, 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 which months have recorded the most. So you can approach it that way. And even if you have a study on HIV, the same approach. If you want to find out which, uh, what, how the picture globally looks like, how um, how it is in Kenya compared to Tanzania, you can you can get those pictures done, and that way it becomes very easy. When you have clear set objectives, you know what you want to achieve in the research, and you know what to, how it will help. And then. Um, yeah, I'll just add on that in the introduction, you, you sort of give a long, a, a very brief overview, a very key overview on what your research is about. And um, you then have a section on your research proposal being the problem statement where you highlight what the problem is, like what you've encountered. The problem can even be something you encountered in the ward uh, that uh, patients are dying because of late biopsy results. So you can look into a research like um, factors influencing biopsy result uh, feedback, something like that. Um, and then your justification, what, what are you trying to achieve in this study and how will it help? Like how will it change? Will it uh, change policy? Will it change uh, the way the hospital is handling things? Will it change the way we uh, see things, um, how will it, how will it change anything? And will it also give very, uh, like, will it break the misconceptions people have? So, so, so that's what your, your study is trying to do. And then, yeah, methodology, it's a very, um, people find it challenging, but as, as, as the more frequently you do it, even in the different sections, it becomes easy. Um, and then I would like to just, um, add on and say that with this time we have, just try to look into writing research proposals, get them ready. Um, with research proposals, you have to, I think the best thing to do is you follow, you pursue your passions, just your annual interests. So do something you like, even if it's particular dis disciplines you're very conversant with. Um, and if you're not very conversant, always try to reach out to uh, like uh, any of your lecturers who are, who can be your supervisors, they are very um, they're very um, well versed in their in their field. So if you're doing something in internal medicine or orthopedics, consult one of them. They can be your supervisor, and they can give you what is realistic and what is not. Yeah, and referencing, I'll just add and and stress what Dan has said. It's really important. Not only um, does it uh, help. Um, you respect other people's work. It also allows you to um, share this information with others. Um, if you're working in a team, I think the best thing to do is you reference on the go, never leave things for later. Because if you're sharing your proposal uh, and if it's already referenced, then whoever is handling the other sections, it's very easy for them to just carry on from where you've start, uh, left. And uh, Mendeley, uh, there are programs like Mendeley, Zotero, and even Microsoft Word that can help you uh, do it. So 
we can have a session on that later. We can take you through a, a, a very um, quick um, installation process and how to use the app. I'll be more than happy to take you through that even. And yeah, timelines, as Dan said, just do not procrastinate, set, set fixed uh, timelines. Do not take too much uh, out of your, uh, like out of, do not eat too much out of your plate and, and try to keep it fixed. Yeah, so um, I think I'll just hand over to Faith. Uh, Faith can handle the Q&A session. I think there are a number of questions I've seen. So she can direct that to um, anyone who can answer the question, either Dr. Balida or Dan. Yeah, so hello, guys, again. Um, so right now is the Q&A session. I've seen like most of you guys have sent your questions uh, through the chat box. and. I think you're going to go through them one by one. And we'll begin with um, Mabuko, who asked from UEAB. I don't know what university is that. Maybe you can clarify for us. Thank you. So um, our first question is, I think this is addressed to Dr. Balidawa. Um, how can we utilize uh, SDG goals in research, the sustainable development goals? How can we utilize them? Dr. Balidawa, are you with us? Yeah, um, I'm still there. And I think uh, when you look at the SDGs, you list them from number one up to number 17, right? And there are those which specifically have the health aspects addressing to them. And you will find that all the areas that we have listed under the scope of work. Are you listening? Um, am I still there? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so if you look at my scope of work, which I have listed as we train our healthcare providers, all the SDGs are addressed. And it's you now to see which component of that SDG that you're interested in, you are actually able to pick a research topic for you to start working on. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, so how can we utilize them in research? So you're basically saying we pick one of them and then you go into research about it. Yes, yeah, so because you see, we have to now, you see, you look at if, if, if it's SDG one, what is its focus? You go through one by one, depending on your area of interest. The way Dan has said, you have to first of all start and identify your area of interest. Unless you have a clear area of interest, you may have challenges picking your research topic. And that's why it was necessary to give you the scope of work where you can actually pick all those cells as designed in that scope of work handed to you. You will be able to identify a research. Is it for promotion? Is it for prevention? Is it for curative? Is it for rehabilitation? Is it for intervention, investigation? It's you to decide because with research, First of all, you have to have the area of interest that you really want to work on. You do a research which you're not interested in, you will find it hard going. You definitely have something that you are really, really interested in. And of course, when we talk about the PHC, the primary healthcare elements, just the first eight give you enough scope of research areas for identification where you yourself as a healthcare professional are able to actually pick an area and you will find that all those SDGs are actually, you know, outlined and somehow touched upon in the scope of work as outlined. And of course, as under the primary healthcare um, issues of concern. So identify your research topic. It is your research topic that will now dictate the direction that you take. And of course, the kind of skills that you now have to apply when it comes to you getting about to do that particular research. Okay, thank you, Doc. I hope my Uber you got um, satisfactorily, you got your answer. Um, thank you, Doc. And then we go to the next question um, from Benjamin Wafula. Can we have an example of a proposal from you, please? I think this is to Dan. And I think for this one, um, Dan, uh, we can, Dan, you can share your email and how guys can reach you so that you can maybe give them an example of a research proposal. Dan, is that okay? 
Yes, I think that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. And then uh, we go to um, Nimrod Mosonic question. Is there a specific format for calculation of sample sizes or is it different uh, for different such proposals? Done? Um, sample size calculation. I think uh, I must say this is usually a tricky one, even for students, even as you continue to to further on your studies, because there is no one sock that fits all. Based on the study that you're doing, I think you'll have a specific kind of a uh, uh, method or or calculation to determine your sample size. For instance, the study I'm doing is a uh, a qualitative study. That means uh, there's not much calculations around it because uh, it's it's a it's a, a purposeful kind of method whereby you just choose the number of participants uh, based on this. There's a certain how do I put it? There's a certain range that you're given to be able to determine your participants. But for quanti quantitative studies, there are more formulas which you have to use. For instance, the common one is the Fisher's formula, which you use to calculate your sample size, the Fisher's formula. And I think there are many more, uh, which you can be able to, think we able to learn in class when you get there. So there are different kinds of methods to use to calculate your sample size. Okay. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Dan. And then you go to Barry Ayumba. Uh, uh, I think it was a comment. Um, okay. So can you share a some can you share a sample of research proposal on any topic for better understanding? Uh, oh, that's an anonymous attendee. So for the Barry, it was a comment uh, saying that you have uh, you you have overviewed fairly well, but some important aspects have not come out. Uh, so uh, Barry, you can reach out to Dan. Maybe he'll get back to you well on that. And then someone else is asking on a research proposal. Oh. Yes. That's actually Dr. Ayumba. <laughs> oh, Dr. He's, Ayumba. Uh, yes, he's part of uh, the COBS uh, committee and he's also an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, I think great. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Yeah, Ayumba, if you would like to say something and add on, um, we can give you that opportunity. Yeah, sure. Because uh, he also supervises a lot of research um, projects. Yeah, great. Dr. Ayumba? Um, I don't know if. Okay, I think when he comes okay, on. Okay, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll advance. wait. Okay, so um, I okay. Uh, can you share a sample of a research proposal on any topic for better understanding? So, uh, uh Dr. Balidawa, you can. I th I've seen you. You would like to answer this question. Um, yeah, um, can we share a sample of a research proposal? Um, I don't know you from, where are you from? You've said you are an anonymous, an anonymous attendee. Uh, so it's difficult for us to even guide you on where you can actually find those proposals. But we, re we do have a repository in the COBS office, meaning we have proposals which are developed by the eight programs that we have at the College of Health Sciences. And if it's medicine, you will get to look at those from students from medical, the medicine program. If it is medical lab sciences, then they are current year three. If it's community health education, they are also in their current year three. And technically speaking, you talk about dentistry, nursing, public health, and so on. All those proposals can be made readily available and you can actually have an idea of how a proposal looks like. And you, of course, you will always, we always try to make sure that if a proposal comes in, it's reviewed by the supervisors, it's reviewed by the committee, and we actually do a thorough job in actually submitting a, to IREC a, a document which has been, which has gone through rigorous um, panel beating and so on. So uh, depending on what your interest is, and as I've said, um, our scope of work just tells you the kind of proposals that you are likely to come across in our COBS, um, COBS office. Okay, great. And then another question from anonymous attendee. What does a mixed study uh, design entail? 
Uh, you want me to answer that as well? Yeah, you can, you can go ahead. Okay, so a mixed study is one whereby you're having um, the two quantitative as well as qualitative. Now, depending on what it is that you want to do, do you want quali a qualitative study predominantly or do you want a quantitative study predominantly? If it is a quantitative, you want qualitative data to support quantitative, you start with qualitative and then go on to quantitative. Why do I say that? That one basically what we're saying is that you want to find out the scope of something, use qualitative. And from now, when you get your scope, you have identified your scope and where you want to go, now go to your quantitative. But you can also start with quantitative, meaning you get that number of people, how many people are saying something about an issue. Now you want to ask why are those people, that particular number are saying something about something. So you start with the quantities, get the numbers. After getting your numbers, you now go and ask them, why are they saying this? So you go to qualitative. In other words, that's the mixed method. And sometimes I always believe that um, a good study is normally that which uses the two. Just giving me numbers without explaining the numbers, you are not telling me anything in your research. At the same time, telling me who is saying what and te not telling me if they're saying that, why are they saying it? then also you're not telling me anything. And therefore we're saying this all round kind of perspective given in research is something that we tend to forget. And you look at your literature review, people have just given you numbers, 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 without explaining why the numbers are the way they are. So I believe that a mixed method takes a bit of each and says, let me put together, I have got these numbers. How can I explain these numbers, why they are the way they are? I don't know whether I've made it very simple, but it's a complex exercise. And it's really, it actually, to be honest, from my perspective, it gives you a more um, kind of um, rounded report because you have said, these are my figures and this is the explanation I give for my figures. But you just give me the figures and also tell me this is, this is somebody who is there, or the one saying this, then you'll only give me 50% of your answers. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Doc. And then we move on to Dan Matumbi. Uh, can, our, can our research be reliant only on secondary sources? Can our research be reliant only on secondary sources? Doc or Dan, uh, just answer the question. I think I'll, I'll say something, then maybe Dr. Baldo also can add on it. Huh? Yes, I think a research can be rely, can rely on just secondary sources. For instance, we are doing a retrospective study, whereby you're just going into the records and going backwards to understand uh, maybe a certain condition you want to explore. So yes, it's possible for you to have focus, use just use secondary sources. Dr. Tari, maybe anything on that? Yes, and it also depends on what it is that you're looking for. And, if you're, and also depends on the sampling procedure which you want to use. And what is it that is your causing, what has made you interested? If you want to look at, just look at secondary data, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking about documentation? Are you looking, at, looking for um, how things are um, being documented? Are you looking for certain conditions in a certain population? What exactly are you looking for? Again, you go back to what exactly it is you're interested in your research. Your research should dictate what you do. Your identified topic should dictate what you do and how you do it. I don't know whether I've made that clear. <laughs> yes, the, the, we have different data sources and all data sources are actually valid and must be made reliable. And that's, the, that's the, something which we have to actually now see how best we embrace in our research training. Thank you so much, Doc and Dan. Um, I think we can go on from there. On to the next question. And um, I think then uh, Dr. Ayumba is also asking, uh, can the slides be availed to the participants? Yeah, I think Doc and Dan will avail them, hopefully. And Dan has left his email behind and I think Doc will also leave her email behind so that you guys can reach them 
whenever you need help on research. Yeah. And the Dr. Yumba is also commenting on CHS recommends the APA citation and referencing. Yeah. And his appreciation to all those who have participated. Doc, do you want to comment do you, on anything? Sorry, Dr. What's, Dr., what's Dr. Yumba's question? Oh, like if the slides can be availed to the participants. Uh, I think uh, that's now up to the organizers to see if they can avail the slides. But I think here it's telling me that it's being live, it's being recorded, and therefore you can get it on YouTube. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. But as well, we can have yes. the slides and disseminate them to the rest of the students. That would be fine. Yeah, I think this is a learning experience. I think it's really nice if they can actually get to know what it takes to be a researcher. And, yeah. um, and of course, and also guiding them on the area where they can actually get their research topics. That would be a good, you know, they just look at that scope of work and emphasizing what it takes to be a researcher. I think that would be of assistance to them. They can be shared. I have no problem with sharing my slides. Yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. We'll disseminate them to the students. And I think Dr. Yumba is commenting that he's experiencing a stable network. But there's a document on research report writing which exists in the COBS office, which is a student guidebook. So I think we'll be able to get that as well. And we, we appreciate. Thank you, Dr. Yumba. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baldawa. And thank you, Dan. We appreciate. And then um, I, I'm going to pass it over to Chana right now, who will briefly talk about our research club before we conclude our session with Muturi and Joyce. Over to you, Chana. Thank you, Faith. So if you have any more questions, just feel free to still write them in the Q&A section while I just talk about our prospective research club. So um, over the past few weeks, we've got to speak to Dr. Validao a lot, um, the COPS committee members, and even um, an extension of the principal's office, uh, Professor Tenge. And we, um, together with um, Faith, who is um, the local officer of SCORI in Moi, um, Joyce uh, for FAMSA, SCOMA, and with Sharon, who is the local officer for the Repub uh, Healthcare Students Journal, we had this idea of starting a Moi College of Health Sciences uh, Research Club. And why did we decide to do this? I mean. We really want to promote the development, uh, the exposure, appreciation, and use of high quality primary research at very early stages of learning. So this club will be focusing in its interest broadly on all the health disciplines um, um, offered in Moise HS and to accommodate all students of various um, years of study for this. So we're hoping to have very frequent uh, sessions um, as as soon as we uh, announce this research club, we'll, we'll, we'll also put a, a link to a Google form where you can fill in your details and your disciplines and what type of topics you would like to do. So we're hoping uh, from that we can plan for sessions. And if this, um, if this current situation persists, we're hoping to do this remotely through such forums like uh, a webinar. And once things normalize, we're hoping to actually meet each other in person, have sessions, um, presentations, and even conferences. So we're hoping that uh, this research club will foster um, research projects and, and even lead them to publication. And we're, we're together with the COBS lecturers, all the mentors in our university, um, we're hoping to pair them up with students so that they can mentor them, they can help them. They, can, they themselves can present their brilliant work. We can learn from them. We can learn from each other. Uh, students in the junior years can present their COBS works, um, even their proposals so that we as students can um, give positive uh, uh, remarks so that they improve, even negative remarks so that they improve uh, with their peers, they feel comfortable and then they can take it to the stage of uh, presenting it to the Cobb's uh, lecturers. And yeah, uh, I think Faith can add on to this and I hope Sharon and Joyce can also add on to what we envision and what we plan. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, sure. So Monda Research Club, uh, it's more of uh, finding mentors and mentees who will help us throughout the research journey, which is, yeah, which is like all through, that's the medical school for us, all through the COMS 1 all the way to COMS 5. And um, as well, for the Google form that will be circulated, you could just write down the topics that you'd want us to talk about during this uh, research club's meeting or anything that you'd like us to do over the meetings and all, because it's like in, in its prior stage and we'll really appreciate your input. And um, yeah, I think Chan has, has covered most parts of it. Motori or Joyce? Um, I think, hi, hi everyone, my name is Sharon Motori, for those who don't know, do not know me. I am a fourth year medical student at Moi University and currently I am serving in the capacity of Repub campus representative for our university. So for, for those who are wondering what Repub is, it's a, like Chana alluded to earlier, it's a publication. It has a, it's a research project which has a publication journal that's registered under the IFMSA medical education systems. So what it does, it allows students to, to publish their research pro bono on, as long as they're members of uh, the IFMSA Students Association. So the main focus areas of Repub is obviously to build capacity for research among those who do not know. And for us who know, already know what research is, they offer mentorship even to keep learning more. And finally, the, the main area is about uh, publishing for undergraduate students. So I would encourage all of us, like Chana has, to start uh, looking out for what kind of research projects we can do and research um, proposals we can write. And then we are able to publish under Repub. And just to note, it was started by our very own two medical students in our school. So that's, that's, that's a thumbs up for us. So thank you. If you have any questions about Repub and uh, the research journal, how you can publish, who you can consult. You can always contact us. I think I'll send out our email addresses and contacts to the um, some groups for, uh, for for more university students and even share it with other students from the other universities. Thank you. Thank you, Motori, for, for that. Uh, is Joyce here? Uh, I think time is far much spent. So I think we'll conclude soon. Is Joyce here? Mm, Joyce, Nick, are you able to unmute Joyce? Yes, Jenna. Could you unmute uh, Joyce, Mina? Yes. I had unmuted her and I think she muted herself. Okay. Um, yes, there, there she is. Joyce, are you able to hear us say something? Okay, it's fine. So uh, Joyce is just, um, yeah, she's part of now FOMSA, uh, which is now Federations of African Medical Students uh, Association. And She's now part of the Standing Committee of Research, Exchange, and, uh, and Medical Education. So together with us, she really wants to develop the, the culture of research in Moi University, and also not only just treat it as an academic uh, requirement, but a philosophy that we carry on to our medical practice and to our profession. So um, I don't know if she, if she can just type out whatever she wants to say, but if not, um, we can always give her 
um, time to address you in future. So um, I think we have a few questions in the Q&A uh, section. Um, but I think I'll just only ask maybe Dr. Falidawat to answer one of them, or even Dan. And that's from Magdalene um, Price-Semi, who's asking, what would you advise someone who knows nothing about research, but is interested in learning and carrying out research? Where should he or she start from? Um, okay, let me see if I can try and answer them. First of all, they have to find out what their discipline is, which is their area. And, and the other thing is, what are they passionate about? What are they, what are they interested in finding out? What do they want to research on? What cohort of uh, people are she or he interested in? Why are they interested in that topic? Why is it, first of all, I think the starting point is have a passion for doing research. Because if you're just going to follow it through dogmatically, something that needs to be done, then of course you'll have challenges, but you must have a, fas a fashion. Be the evidence-based practitioner. You must be basing whatever you do on evidence. The fact that you are doing something in a certain way, you must be able to question whether what you're doing is the correct thing. I mentioned something about the practice, the harm and the benefit. Are we doing good? Are we doing bad? If we're doing bad, how do we improve? If we are doing good, how do we improve? All right, so in other words, basically you must have a starting point and this doing research starts with you, having an interest, having a passion and having a research topic that you're passionate about. I think that's the starting point. And depending on where you are, even a first year can do research. And I believe anybody can do research if they put their mind to it. Right, so maybe you can get in touch with the COP secretariat. They'll be able to assist you if you're year one, if you're year two, year three, year four, uh, and even year five, because those action research projects are very, very good. And I think most of the counties should actually be listening to what students are saying in their COP five reports. So if you can also look for us, you just check out the COPS committee. We have a year one coordinator. We have year two coordinator, year three coordinator. They will be able to direct you to the right person who will assist you depending on what level you are at. And if you're something beyond post, um, post um, graduate, of course we have now added um, community, we've added community health to take care of the postgraduate research arm of COBS. So I think anyone who's interested in COBS just have, you know, in research, just comes to COBS and we will start from there to see how best we can guide you. Thank you. Okay, great, you've heard. Um, and if you're, yeah, do not get intimidated by any of these lectures. That's what I've learned. Uh, they're not scary at all. They're very welcoming, they're very helpful. Um, we, all, um, we all have to learn from baby steps to even get to walking. So. They also know that that's a natural process and no one is going to judge you for uh, not knowing a particular thing, no matter your position and relative to any um, academic year you are in. I mean, we're all learning and that has to be a very open and friendly uh, thing that we have to understand and approach. So um, if you are, if you, even if you're willing to, um, if you're willing to come up with the research and you're not sure where to start from, feel free to even email or contact us. We're, we're very uh, willing to help you and we can connect you to who we think would really take you to a higher, um, yeah, to a higher state of uh, guidance and to really push you through um, completion. So uh, I think uh, my part is done. And I think if there's any other questions, you can just uh, text us later. But I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Validawa, um, Dana Buri for their time, for their efforts in uh, really addressing these topics that we um, thought of. 
for their preparation and for their great insight and, and, and help. And also thank them for their great work that they're doing. Um, we, wish, we wish you the best and all the success in your endeavors. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone who attended. Um, truly honored that you joined us and we truly honor that you took time, effort um, to engage in this conversation and learn. So thank you and thank you Faith and Joyce um, and Sharon for, for, for being part of this awesome team and for, for arranging this. You, you guys can conclude my, 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 my word flags is over, yeah. Thank you, China, for that. Um, so I'm seeing emails have been sent out so that you guys can reach out uh, for the necessary help in regard. to research, just check your chat boxes, taking much of your time, but it's been amazing. It's been an insightful session. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Balidawa and Dan. So, uh, we are more geared now towards being critical thinkers and doing more towards research, especially us in COBS3 right now, where we are geared to proposal writings and all. I think we've gotten a pre-class towards COBS3 and 4 as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayumba as well. I think, yeah, thank you for the comments that you uh, put across for us and thank you for everyone who's commented uh, for us. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate for taking time uh, for this session and though it's taken like an hour and 38 minutes now but we really appreciate and um, in score we say blue hugs always so yeah god bless thank you thank you okay, bye everyone take care bye bye